Now let's proceed to investigations. What, what sort of investigations would you perform with, if someone presents with difficulty breathing, sputum production, um, as well as a cough? So number one is spirometry. Now, here is what it looks like essentially. So basically, what happens is you take a massive deep breath in and a forced exhale out for about five, six seconds. Um, and this will give you a spirometry reading which can be printed out. Now let us look at a normal spirometry graph that gets usually uh, showed on the paper or on the screen. So the spirometry can give you a graph. Uh, we have flow on the y-axis and volume the volume of air in the lungs or exhaled out or inhaled in on the x-axis. So it's just the volume of air on the x-axis. So here you're taking a deep breath in, a deep inspiration, and here you are performing a forced quick expiration and you do it for about six seconds. So you're trying to empty out your lungs. Um, we can also find other measurements using just this graph. The volume on the x-axis is therefore your total lung capacity and the amount of air remaining in the lung after your forced expiratory volume is your residual volume. So this always stays there. The amount of air following deep inspiration and forced expiration is, your, is known as your vital capacity. When evaluating a patient with possible COPD, spirometry is performed. Now, spirometry is performed pre- and post-bronchodilator admission to determine whether airflow limitation is present, partial, or it's fully reversible. So let us look at what the spirometry graph will look like in an obstructive lung disease, such as chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which again encompasses asthma, chronic bronchitis, and emphysema. Here is the flow to volume diagram. So the patients do lose some inspiratory volume when taking a deep breath in. And when breathing out as hard and quick as possible, it becomes difficult to breathe out as time progresses. So as you exhale, force exhale out for six seconds, it becomes more and more difficult. So you see here the dotted lines represent normal deep inspiration and normal forced expiration. Compared to the normal spirometry on the right, in the obstructive spirometry, you can see a dent in the forced expiratory phase, which is indicative of the obstructive pattern. In obstructive, we have um, a decrease in forced expiratory volume and a decrease in the forced expiratory volume over forced vital capacity ratio. Now a decrease of 70% of this ratio is indicative of COPD. So again, less than 70% is like a diagnosis. So because we looked at obstructive uh, disease on the spirometry, we might as well look at restrictive lung problems. So restrictive lung problems um, is actually much more obvious in that if this was your normal breathing, Restrictive gives you something like this, a big decrease in both flow and volume. Okay, so that was spirometry. Another investigation you can perform is chest x-ray, which helps you rule out cancers as well as other heart problems. But you do see some features in advanced COPD. So if here is a chest x-ray, you can see hyperexpansion hyper or, or hyperinflation of the lungs which also means you could have a flattening of the diaphragms, which is a sign of hyperinflation as well. Here, uh, uh, you can, you can, we can have also pulmonary hypertension, which means that there is a prominent hyla um, vascular um, shadow. You also may find a bullae, um, a fluid buildup in certain types of emphysema. Um, also, when you look at a chest x-ray, um, the chest x-ray can look darker within the lungs. The, the gas, was the air, so the, sh the lung shadow can look a lot darker because there's a lot of air uh, trapped. We can also perform a pulse oximetry to check for oxygen saturation and the signs of hypoxemia. A full
full blood count is important to check for signs of anemia. Arterial blood gas is another investigation to check for pH. Um, so I guess the severity of the respiratory problem, if the problem can also be respiratory acidosis or respiratory alkalosis, but typically it's respiratory acidosis. Usually in COPD, especially late stage, it's respiratory acidosis. ECG is also important to check for heart involvement and to rule out MI and heart failure. So here we are looking at an ECG strip. Here is a normal ECG with the PQRST waves. On an ECG for a person who has severe um, chronic bronchitis, for example, we may see signs of right ventricular strain. Um, and so this in a right ventricular strain on leads V1 to V4, we can see inverted T waves. Okay, so that was some investigations that you can perform, the main ones. Now people can have different severities of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. They can have different severities. And so there is a classification made um, to categorize this. So the classification helps to assess the severity so that appropriate management and treatment can be made. So this is the classification, which is also for the diagnosis, by the way. So we will look at the stages, the severity of the COPD, as well as the um, forced expiratory volume one. So let's look at stage one. Stage one is mild severity. The ratio, the v, uh, FEV over FVC ratio is less than 70%, which is again important because it diagnoses obstructive pulmonary disease. For mild COPD, um, the FEV1 is equal to or greater than 80 predicted. Now, these, now we'll look at mainly the American system, I think, but it's important to note the Australian. So in Australia, the FEV1 can be between 60% to 80%, and this can be classified as mild. Stage 2, which is moderate, the ratio is, again, has to be below 70 because that is your diagnosis of obstructive. The FEV1 um, is between 50% to 80% predicted, but in Australia, this is moderate, is classified as between 40% to 59%. Then stage three is severe, which is where the ratio is less than 70%, which is, you know, normal, uh, normal for COPD. And then we have the FEV1, which is between 30% to 50% predicted. In Australia, severe is classified as below 40%. And um, there's another staging, which is stage four, which is very severe. This is where the ratio, uh, FEV1 to FVC ratio is less than 70%. But the FEV1... Um, it can be less than 30% or the FEV1 is less than 50 plus you have chronic respiratory failure and chronic respiratory failure you have two types and this depends on the level of oxygen and carbon dioxide in your blood. So four stages, different severities um, and different FEV uh, readings. So that was the classification for the severity of COPD. Now how did we come to that? Well, assessment of severity of condition is based on three factors. The severity of the symptoms, spirometry, and risk, ex risk of exacerbations. Using the three features above, you, you, you classify the COPD, which we just looked at, mild, moderate, severe, very severe. And using the COPD classification, and as well as other factors, you, you follow what's called the gold guidelines for COPD management. Before looking at the management of COPD, it's important to look at just quickly the physical examination. When we perform a physical examination, what are some things we see? So physical exam examination of emphysema is what we'll uh, look at. In examination of emphysema, we see prolonged expiratory phase because we're trying to push the air out of our lungs. There's also pursed lips. There's also over distension of the lungs, barrel chest use of accessory muscles. There's decreased intensity of breath sounds. And finally, we, we hear wheezing during auscultations. Now let us move into the management. We will look at the main things for management according to the Davidson's textbook. So it is very important to um, stop smoking, smoking cessation. 
because smoking increases the severity of COPD. That's common sense. Number two is vaccination. It's important to prevent exacerbations of COPD because usually lung infections make things a lot worse. So by vaccinating the patient, you prevent um, further problems. Third management, which is very important, is the use and administration of bronchodilators. So we're, we're going to pharmacology now. There are two types of bronchodilators. There's beta-2 agonists or anticholinergics. Both beta agonists or anticholinergics can be short-acting or long-acting, and they're typically inhaled. So inhaled is uh, it goes, it's, uh, you puffers, essentially. So let us zoom into the lungs here, the bronchioles, and let's look at the short-acting um, bronchodilators, so short-acting, SA. These are prescribed on an as-needed basis. What the short-acting bronchodilators essentially do is that they decrease the symptomatic exposure in patients with less severe symptoms. Short-acting bronchodilators are not considered maintenance. Long-acting bronchodilators are needed for this. Now let's look at the mechanism of action of the beta-2 agonists and the anticholinergics. So let's zoom into the, the layers of well, like the smooth muscle of the bronchial here. So here we have the epithelial cells which are surrounded by the smooth muscles. The smooth muscles can contract and relax depending on the signals they are receiving. So the smooth muscle have receptors on their cell surface. These are the muscarinic 3 receptors as well as the beta 2 receptors. The parasympathetic nerve supplies the smooth muscle of the airways and it releases acetylcholine. When acetylcholine binds to the M3 receptor, muscarinic 3 receptor, it activates the G protein intracellularly, which stimulates the phospholipase C, converting PIP2 to IP3. Essentially, what's important is that IP3 is then uh, responsible uh, for the contraction of the smooth muscles downstream uh, through the release of calcium. Now, the short-acting muscarinic antagonists um, they essentially inhibit these M3 receptors. And so because they block the M3 receptors on the respiratory smooth muscles, it also inhibits the downstream cascade, thus inhibits the contraction of smooth muscles. I hope that made sense. Now let us look at the beta-2 receptors. Well, adrenaline and noradrenaline from the sympathetic stimulation binds to this receptor and activates, stimulates G protein again, activating adenylate cyclase. Activated adenyl cyclase converts ATP to cyclic AMP. An increase in intracellular cyclic AMP causes or results in smooth muscle relaxation. Cyclic AMP is important because it causes smooth muscle relaxation, and this is a good thing for obstructive lung diseases. And so prescribing short-acting beta-2 agonist stimulates the beta-2 receptors and thus leads to bronchodilation. So looking at long-acting drugs, um, long-acting drugs are regularly scheduled. Long-acting uh, inhaled bronchodilators are added for those who are more severe. And they do essentially the same thing, but work for longer, essentially. And these are your long-acting muscarinic antagonists, which inhibits the M3, and your long-acting beta-2 agonists, which stimulates your beta-2 receptors on smooth muscles in the respiratory airways. Inhaled glucocorticoids are used in combination with long-acting bronchodilators, and corticosteroids are not used alone. Number five, pulmonary rehabilitation is another very important aspect of management. COPD patients often have a decreased physical uh, level of physical activity because of dyspnea. A decrease in of physical activity causes a, you know, leads to a vicious cycle, so we get worsening dyspnea because we don't exercise, we lose muscle. Now, pulmonary re rehabilitation aims to break this cycle through several things. Firstly, by exercising, through exercise. Two, through nutrition because 30% of severe COPD patients have protein calorie malnutrition, for example. 
three, smoking cessation, four, education of their condition, and five, breathing exercises such as uh, pursed lips, which helps in uh, with the gas trapping. Finally, there is also six management, which is oxygen therapy, and this is very important for a chronic COPD who 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 are suffering with of who, who has hypoxemia. So the last uh, management is the surgical intervention, and there's two main ones. The first is lung volume reduction surgery, which is essentially removing parts of the lung that don't work. And then this last one is lung transplantation, which obviously has a uh, criteria for that. So I hope that made all sense. Um, thank you for watching.